Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Maryland Risk Management Education Podcast. My name is Paul Geringer, and I'm the Extension Legal Specialist here in the Department of Ag and Resource Economics at the University of Maryland. And today we have back on the podcast um, an episode with Dr. Bart Fisher, who is the co-director at the Texas A&M Ag and Food Policy Center. And um, his center has recently put out a report looking at some proposed capital gains tax and estate tax changes to kind of see how that would impact um, farms in the U.S. And he'll talk about his analysis in there and what they found looking at it. So I will turn it over to myself and Bart. So Bart, we got you back on the podcast again today. So why don't we go ahead and let you introduce yourself again so folks remember who you are. Sure. I'm Bart Fisher. I am the co-director of the Agricultural and Food Policy Center at Texas A&M University, also on the Ag Econ faculty here on campus. Okay. And yeah, I'm, I'm having you on today to talk about an interesting report your center just released on sort of some estate tax changes and capital gains tax changes. So I thought I'd have a start off with just telling us a little bit about what the Ag and Food Policy Center at Texas A&M does and then kind of leading into that sort of how this analysis happened to kind of get people an overview of what your center does and sort of the resources it has. Uh, Sure, so our center works primarily for the House and Senate Agriculture Committees and has for almost 40 years. Um, A lot of the work we do admittedly is around farm bills, so looking at farm policy analysis, Uh, but we also are called on to look at a number of other issues. You know, we have an ongoing study right now looking at the livestock markets, which has been a hot topic. Um, and then we were also just called on recently to do uh, to do this tax study. And one of the primary ways we go about doing our work is we have what are called representative farms. Uh, these are essentially farms that are on paper, but we the way we, we do the work is that we work with, in each location, we work with panels of four to six producers. Uh, we have 94 of those operations in 30 different states. So we work with producers all over the country. Um, And then we're able to take that information back and include it in a a whole farm simulation model that we use here on campus. And so when when uh, Congress wants to look at policy changes, we're able to simulate the impact that that would have on the bottom line for farms and ranches around the country. So we have 64 crop farms, 20 dairies and then 10 uh, 10 ranches, standalone ranches that we work with again in, in 30 different states. Okay. So yeah, you guys just looked at these two pieces of tax legislation. So just kind of broadly, what can you tell us about each one of them and what should people know about them just based on looking at the ag parts that you did that will impact the ag community? Sure, so about a month ago, uh, the so Congressman G.T. Thompson, the ranking member of the House Ag Committee, and then Senator John Bozeman, the ranking member of the Senate Ag Committee, uh, reached out to us asking if we would look at a couple of pieces of, of tax legislation. Uh, as you know, Paul, just with all the spending that's going on in the federal government, there's kind of an, an again, an increasing awareness of the debt that's piling up. And, you know, there's also a lot of uh, conversation about raising taxes to help pay for that. And one of those, has, you know, it has to do with taxes at the at the point of inheritance. And so they asked us to look at a couple of proposals that are out there. One of those uh, is a bill by Senator Van, Van Hollen, the STEP Act. Uh, another is uh, is a bill dealing with the estate tax exemption from uh, Senator Bernie Sanders uh, called the For the 99.5% Act. And so they asked us if we'd look at the implication of both of those bills. Uh, I would say it's less about those individual pieces of legislation than it is about this general concept. You know, one of them, uh, one of them deals with elimination of stepped up basis, which, as you noted, would reimpose capital gains tax at the point of inheritance. The other looks at lowering the estate tax exemption. And so really you're catching kind of those two broad themes with uh, with the work that we did. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I will put a link to your report in the notes so folks can look at it because I did find it fascinating on how some of the impacts would be sure that we're going to get into so looking at this i didn't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about how you went about analyzing the impact on the ag community with the two pieces of legislation sure and just to give a little bit more background on both both of those bills too as part of you know set the setup here so the, the step act of the sensible taxation and equity promotion act uh, is the really the one that would eliminate stepped up basis on the death of an owner. And really for the last hundred years, stepped up basis is really the tool 
that's prohibited you know, capital gains from applying at the point of death. And so the elimination of stepped up basis really means that, uh, you know, that you would be subjected to capital gains at the, at the point of death. There is a million dollar exclusion in the STEP Act. So you're, you know, one of a million dollars of those gains are excluded, but when land, I mean, just looking at land alone where it's tripled in value over the last 20 plus years, that's where a lot of the, the, the net worth for farms is held, as we all know, is in, is in land. And so that $1 million exclusion, while, while a million dollars is a lot of money, it doesn't go that far, particularly on multi-generational uh, operation. Oh. You know, on the estate tax side, so the, the For the 99.5% Act, uh, well, we do have estate taxes right now. They, they do apply, but uh, you know, the levels right now for 2021 are 11.7 million per individual, which is, you know, right at 23.7 million per couple. And so, um, you know, certainly there are big operations and we can talk about a couple of our operations that would still, you know, hit that because we did look at that under one of our scenarios, but, you know, under current law, most ag operations are under, you know, a net worth of 23.4 million. And so they, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, but, the 99.5% Act proposes to reduce that back to 2009 level. So the exemption would fall for an individual, it would fall from 11.7 million down to three and a half million or 7 million per couple. And suddenly you start picking up more operations at, a, at the $7 million level. Uh, that Act also raises the marginal rates uh, for estate taxes as well. Um, and so that's just a little bit of setup. You know, in terms of the way we went about doing the analysis, uh, we did utilize all of our representative farms. So again, there's 94 of those spread around the country. Uh, one interesting thing, because we don't do taxes every day, um, you know, we, and really our farms are a snapshot in time and we project forward going for the next five to 10 years. So we're always able to give Congress kind of an outlook going forward, but because it's a snapshot in time, we don't have a lot of historical or cost basis information on those farms. And so the way we went about doing the work and we you know wrote this in the report as well is that we reached out to all of our panelists and say give us a sense for your operations how long that uh how long the land has been held and we used that as the basis for helping construct a cost basis on our on our farms and and no surprise a lot of the land has been held a long time because a lot of it is you know the farm has been in the family for multiple generations and so uh, for a lot of that land it's been uh it's been in the family uh, a long time. I mean, a perfect example on our on our ranches. You know, over thirty percent of it, the land had been in the family over thirty over thirty years. Well, we know exactly where land values have gone over the last 30, 30 years, and that's up by a lot. Yeah. So, so anyway, we uh, uh, we did use the representative farms. We ended up looking at uh, several different scenarios. Um, so just to run quickly through those, one of them was just our baseline, which is the is current law with no, we don't assume generational transfers. And so that's just kind of the baseline we start with. Um, the first thing we did look at, though, was under current law. So without any of these proposed changes, what happens if you do have a death in the family or a transfer to a subsequent generation? Uh, in, in that scenario, interestingly enough, only two of the 94 farms are impacted and they're two large dairies. And again, it's because of that under current law, it only, the state tax really uh, only applies to operations with net worths over 23.4 million. And so you have very few, roughly 2% of the farms that would be impacted under current law. Um, the other scenarios that we looked at though were, you know, our, our third scenario was to impose the STEP Act. So assume the STEP Act uh, is law and that there's a death in the family that triggers a generational transfer. Uh, the other scenario was exactly the same for the 99.5% Act. You know, assume that those estate tax exemptions are drastically lowered and that there's a death, you know, triggering a, a transfer. Uh, and then we looked at also at those being imposed at the exact same time. So those were all the scenarios uh, that we that we ran through. Okay. And yeah, looking at your analysis, you know, sort of how does that impact how did you figure out that what would the impact be to farms that in your representative farms? Sure. And so, you know, again, if you just look at that, you know, current law scenario, as I mentioned, very few people are in, are yeah. impacted. Uh, again, it's just two dairies. But so under the STEP Act, the elimination of stepped up, uh, up basis, it really is flipped completely on its head. So instead of two of the 94 being impacted, it jumps to 92 of the 94. 
it's almost all the farms and that's with the million dollar exemption in place because i mean you all the know you know the the old saying that you know farmers are you know are land rich and cash poor right is that that on paper there's net worth but it's not held in it's not held in cash it's tied up into the productive assets of the operation and so that million even with the million dollar exemption doesn't go terribly far uh, so it would affect 92 of our 94 farms uh, the average tax liability would be seven hundred and twenty six thousand dollars that's averaged over those 92 farms so almost three quarters of a million million dollars and interestingly the only the two farms that aren't it would be all of our farms uh, but the two that aren't impacted are primarily because they're leased land you know they that was the thing i found the most interesting that those <laughs> two just lease all their land and that's why sure. they're not impacted <laughs> It's two of our rice farms in Texas. Uh, they 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 lease the land, and interestingly enough, there is that even even in that case, if they're leasing from family who are implicated by this, you know, you could easily see it ending up being reflected in their rental rates too. So even though they're not directly impacted, they may ultimately be impacted downstream, you know, in the form of of higher rental rates too, long term. But yeah, we're. I mean, seven hundred twenty-six thousand dollars. We're talking about a lot of money in terms of tax liability on those operations. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We'll get to that just in a minute because that was the other thing I found interesting in the analysis. Sure. So, if, just to quickly run through the others, then on the scenario four, this you know imposing the estate, the reduction of the estate tax exemptions, the the step act, Senator Sanders bill, um, it impacts ninety or it impacts forty-one of the ninety-four farms. So roughly forty-four percent of our farms. So again, under that bill the the state tax exemption is seven million so there's no question we have farms that fit under the net worth fits under that exclusion uh where they would be wouldn't be impacted but you do have 90 you do have 41 of our farms that would be hit the average liability tax liability in that case is 2.17 million dollars uh, and then if you put all this together, put them both together, and there, it, it was important to look at them. You can't just add them together, right? Because there's a netting effect between these. You know, the capital yeah. gains you pay can be netted out against the estate tax liability. But uh, so in that scenario, you put them together, 98% of the farms are impacted. The average liability is $1.4 million. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And I guess why you can see why, and I think we wrote this in the report too. But you know, every time we're asked to do a study by Congress, you know, we'll typically reach out to all of our panelists. And across those ninety-four farms, again, we have four to six producers on every farm. And I I didn't mention earlier, but we update those every two years. So our team is constantly traveling around the country, keeping all of those current. Uh, and up to date. But anytime we're asked to do a study by Congress, typically we'll reach out to the panelists just to make sure we have everything calibrated, see if there's additional context from their perspective, you know, that they think should be provided. And in this case, we had the highest response rate we've ever had uh, on this particular study. So you can, I mean, there's just a, there's a very real sensitivity to this yeah. because, um, you know, the big question is how in the world do you handle a tax liability of that magnitude? So yeah, it was the highest response rate we've ever had. <laughs> that was impressive. And the, yeah, getting on the tax liability, that was the next thing in your study that kind of shocked me is how long the impact of net cash, net cash, net cash income. Yeah. Yeah. Net cash income, just how many years it may take. Well, what I mean, and that is one thing I'm glad you flagged that. Cause that's one thing we included in the report itself, you know, is, some sort of context because you know how much is 726,000 or how much is you know 1.4 million I mean, it's a lot of money but you know it, certainly if you're if you're a smaller producer you know it you, so you need something to to ground that in so for every one of the farms you know if you actually go to our report uh, there's a couple tables towards the end where we try to provide some context and one of those things we do is through net cash farm income and so if you think it's really your your cash income on the operation before you pay things like family living and you know for us our the the producers we work with these are all full-time family operations where we don't where we don't consider outside income it is literally full-time operations that are family owned and operated that are more commercials that are more commercial scale that's who we work with so you have to think of it in terms of net cash farm income is used it's what's left over after you pay those cash expenses and it's the it's the money you use to live as a family you know to pay your tax obligations to pay off you know to pay pay down principal on loans and that sort of thing and so we put that in there as context of okay you have this tax liability 
how big is it relative to your net cash farm income? And, you know, in some cases, I mean, for example, one of our ranches in South Dakota, uh, the tax liability for doing both scenarios at once, you know, would take 95 years. And, and this is assuming you didn't pull anything out, you know, for your family living, it would take 95 years to pay off that debt. Uh, that, and that's assuming, you know, some of the, you know, a couple of the bills that are floating around out there, they do have provisions where the IRS would carry the debt for up to 15 years. Um, but even then, you know, some of the scenarios we've looked at far exceed that. And it assumes that you can actually get, you would be able to get uh, finance. Our, our analysis just assumes you can find financing for it. Reality is probably different and it, you know, you may have scenarios where people end up having to sell off, you know, the operation to keep part of it going. So. Yeah, that's why I got to think about like how much farmland would you have to sell off, then eat more capital gains taxes on it just to sell it and no, pay your tax bill off. Yeah, I think, I mean, and part of that, and it's tough, you know, when you're writing a report of this size to, because because those are all anecdotal, right? Every, the fact is every single operation is going to respond differently. Part of it's going to depend how much cash you have on hand as well. And, you know, and we include that one of the other tables, you know, we include ending cash uh, in 2026, you know, as another measure of like, well, do you have, you know, did you, how much cash did you end up having to bleed down, you know, as a result of this? And so we did try to provide some context because every single operation is going to be different, just like it is, you know, out in the real world. Um, you know, you presumably are going to have cases where folks would have, I mean, just couldn't get the financing to do it. They may be able to use the IRS financing, but then there's a big question of, well, as you finance the rest of your operation, what you have this big debt hanging over your operation. Yeah. Can you actually get financing to keep operating is, is another big question. So it does raise, I mean, it ra certainly raises beyond the eye popping number, it raises a number of questions about implications on how you would go about actually extinguishing the debt over time. Yeah, that was kind of my biggest thought is like, how do you get rid of that debt? Even if you're taking debt out to get rid of that debt, yeah. who's gonna loan you money? For the rest of the operation just to pay off the taxes on that sure so yeah valid question so do you guys have any a future analysis plan beyond just this or you know i know there's a lot of there's still a lot of questions out there i mean you know another one is on 1031 there's a lot of chat of, of conversation about yeah. the 20, 1031 white kind exchange where essentially you can avoid capital gains if you if you have capital gains on sale of an asset if you buy a similar asset you know you're you're able to kind of shield capital gains. There's talk about doing away with the 1031 provisions. We haven't yet been asked. I've been asked a lot of questions about it. We haven't been asked to do any analysis you know, of it. That one's pretty straightforward though, right? I mean, and it's it's a tool that's used pretty, it's pretty straightforward. So right now it seems like most of the focus is on stepped up basis just because agriculture is so incredibly you know sensitive to that. And again, the exclusion, the more you exclude, certainly you could you know, shield some producers from it. But again, even with a million dollar exclusion, you're hitting, you're hitting all of our operations that aren't exclusively rented land, right? So uh, it, uh, it, it sweeps in a lot of people. Yeah, it does. And any out last thoughts you want to share on the report? I mean, I think it's pretty good. It's pretty, uh, the results are pretty clear in black and white that it's a huge, I mean, it's a huge issue for, for production agriculture. One, you know, we, I, I will at least acknowledge, you know, we weren't asked to look at, but part of the conversation too is, okay, well, you know, we can do these things for other segment segments of the country or other segments of industry, but we could exempt agriculture or we could exempt, you know, small business from some of these things. And, and so while that wasn't because we were asked to look specifically at these two bills, I do know, you know, for your listeners that, um, you know, that will be one of the reactions of, well, but farms and ranches, you know, could be exempted from this. And I, I think the biggest questions there are, you know, one, how do you write the exemptions, right? Because uh, it's a very slippery slope that uh, it's, it is very hard to exclude, to, to exclude people <laughs> from things because, uh, you have to have it written, and I don't need to tell you you're an attorney. You have, it, it is very hard to write those things uh, to make sure that you're catching everyone and that no one falls through the cracks. And so that to me is a, a big caution there is can it be written in such a way that you actually do protect those? Because none of these, none of our operations are cookie cutter. We have multiple different family members beyond just direct 
you know, lineal descendants, you know, nieces, nephews that are involved in operations. Uh, what happens when one sibling needs to sell out to another sibling? Like, how are all those situations handled? All of those would have to be contemplated. And we're presuming here that you actually can contemplate all of them. I think the other two then is that, you know, presumably there would be a deferred tax liability, you know, that's a, that's associated with the operation, right? If you have, if you have a death in the family that triggers a generational transfer, but you're going to be excluded from paying the tax. Presumably, there's a tax liability that follows that operation in the event that, you know, something else triggers, you know, you know, in the event that that exclusion no longer applies and you have to satisfy the liability, you actually have to pay the tax. So suggest to me that there's a deferred tax liability that would follow that operation. Well, how does the lending community respond to that if there's a deferred tax liability hanging over that farm? So I, I, uh, I just throw those out there as food for thought. We have not yet been asked to, you know, to, uh, to look into all of those. And so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not offering a judgment either way. It's more just, you know, food for thought and things to think about as I know, you know, part of the conversation has gone, has gone in that direction. So oh, those are good food for thought. So I guess I will end the conversation there and thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Paul, thanks for having me on. No problem. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you have any questions, you can email me at lgoering at umd.edu. And I put information for how to get in touch with Dr. Fisher in the show notes as well, along with a copy of the report and where you can find it at. There's also, uh, if I do this correctly now, an audio transcript as well with this. So you can download that as well. So thank you again for listening and enjoy the rest of your day.